Hi, I'm Ellen Jaco with MC Iris, the Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species uh, group here in Monroe County. And I also want to introduce Jillian Field, who's on the call. And she is one of um, our very active volunteers with the MC Iris group. So she'll be telling you some of the things that she's doing uh, as well. But uh, the main focus of this talk is to discuss uh, the flowering theme, which we call the uh, spring flowering uh, invasive plants, those that you may see out there right now, and how to identify them and control them. We started this series with a winter version of Vicious Villain, uh, looking at those species that are uh, evident and able to be controlled in winter. So now this is our spring version. So let me bring up my screen so that I can share it with you. And I want to encourage you um, I want to encourage you to stop, break in at any point, and ask questions. Um, if you want to uh, go deeper on a particular species or something I'm saying doesn't make sense, you can use the chat box, but also you can unmute yourself and jump in if you like with the question. So let's talk about identifying and controlling the spring invasive plants. First, I told you I'm from MCIRS and so is Jillian. This is our mission statement. We're here as a co coalition of Monroe County citizens aimed at reducing the environmental and economic impact of invasive species in our county through education and action. And our website is shown here. It'll come up a couple of other times because we put a lot of the content onto our website in terms of uh, all of the resources that you need to be able to ID and control invasive plants, mc-iris.org. Some of the things that we do, just so that you know who we are, we do educational programs like this one, um, and they are on our YouTube channel. Um, all of this you can find if you just go to our uh, website as well, links to these. We provide resources like the calendar of control, which we're gonna be using today and, and talking about and how and when to control every species. We loan out toolkits to Monroe County residents. And these have uh, polar bear, which is a big weed wrench that pulls shrubs like Asian bush honeysuckle right out of the ground, as well as loppers, pruners, uh, pruning saw, and more. And we give free invasive surveys to any resident in Monroe County. We'll come to your land and tell you what you've got there in terms of what's invasive, what's native, and what recommendations we have for the management of your land. So the species that I plan to focus on today are these, garlic mustard and dame's rocket, and multiflora rose, autumn olive, Asian bush honeysuckle, privet, and calorie pear. I'm gonna kind of talk about them in those two groups because the control methods are the same within those groups. And when we finish, if there's a species that I haven't talked about, um, feel free to bring that up and, and we can discuss. Oh, first there's a commercial. I have to give you this commercial. Um, one thing that MCRS does every year is we declare it the year of an invasive species. It's a reduced one invasive species challenge because people can be overwhelmed when we start talking about all these different species. Last year we started this and we focused on Asian bush honeysuckle. This year, 2021, we're focused on purple winter creeper. And that means that if you join this challenge and take pictures before and after an area of winter creeper that you control, whether pulling it or spraying it, we will give you free native ground covers in return. So the details are on our website um, and that's linked right onto the homepage. So it's the first thing you'll see. So keep that in mind. Um, if you want some native plant covers that we'll be handing out in early September, um, just kill some winter creeper. Oh, and these are the six that we are giving away in case that entices you more. Each of these is a native that can serve as a ground cover depending on the situation that you have. And these are what you will be rewarded with if you kill purple winter creeper. 
All right, let's start. Garlic mustard. Now, when we did the winter version of this, Vicious Villain, we also talked about garlic mustard because it is an evergreen rosette. Um, what you have with garlic mustard is a cool season biennial plant. So it's got a two year life cycle. It germinates now and grows for the first year and it will be an evergreen rosette in the winter. So we talked in the winter about how to control it then. But come spring, those rosettes bolt and put up these flower heads with four petaled white flowers. And that's the stage we're at right now in Monroe County. Garlic mustard is in full bloom. And then in the next few weeks, the plants will start producing these pods, these long skinny pods that are full of the seeds. The leaves, here's the first year. This is, these are the basil leaves. This is what you see in the winter time, just this little rosette. Um, and that then bolts and produces the flowers this time of year. There are a couple similar species. There's the um, native spring crest, cardamine bulbosa, and purple crest, which are both shown here because they're mustards and they have four petaled white flowers, just like garlic mustard does but they're really quite different if you're familiar with those native mustards because um, they don't smell like garlic. If you crush a garlic mustard leaf, it smells very strongly of, of garlic. Um, and the leaves are usually longer than wide, whereas the garlic mustard leaves are usually wider than long and have very even tubing all around the leaf. So that's what garlic mustard looks like and how to identify it. This is what it looks like now in very bad places. This is a terrible garlic mustard infestation. Often it's much more scattered than this, but where it takes over, you can see just uh, an absolute sea of uh, garlic mustard. And that is one of the reasons it's such a concern is that it's able to displace native wildflowers. Um, it can also cause real problems for butterflies in the Pyridae family. They are dependent on mustard plants. The, the larvae eat mustard plants. And so this time of year, if, if you're walking through the wood, you will often see small white butterflies floating over the native plant. Sensing the cinegrin, which is the chemical that's in mustard. And when it senses that, it knows that's where I need to lay my eggs. The problem is that garlic mustard has orders of magnitude more cinegrin than the native mustards, like the spring crest and purple crest we talked about. So once the larvae egg, the egg hatches and the larvae starts eating the garlic mustard, it dies because that amount of chemical is toxic to the uh, caterpillar. So there's numerous ways that garlic mustard can impact um, the environment. Now, before I tell you how to control garlic mustard, we need to talk about Dame's Rocket. And, and you may have noticed that I'm, the format of the slides that you're seeing right now are from this field guide that we're using on waterproof paper. And uh, you can contact me to order one of these. For $10 if you pick up in person, or $13 if we have to mail it to you. But each of the species in here has all the information that I'm sharing with you, the description and the history of the plant, how it got here, flowers, fruits, leaves, all the identification information. So for Dame's Rocket, in some ways, you can almost think of this as a purple garlic, garlic mustard. It's a mustard. Look at those four petaled flowers, once again, just like garlic mustard. But the color of the petals can vary from a very pale pink to a very dark pink, even purple. Um, it is also a biennial in the same way that garlic mustard is. So there are overwintering rosettes. At this time of year, the plants I have bolted and I haven't seen any open quite yet, but within the next week, I'm sure that the Dame's Rocket will be in flower. Um, you particularly find it on roadsides and along creeks. Um, along Clear Creek, 
uh, Cedar Bluffs Nature Preserve, if you're familiar with that, just south of Bloomington, um, has a Dame's Rocket problem, and we're always pulling it there along Clear Creek. It too produces a long skinny pod that is full of seeds. This is what the leaves of Dame's Rocket look like once the uh, basal rosette bolts and puts up a stem. Um, one thing that I find very noticeable is that the short hairs that are on it, when you feel it, it feels just very soft, fuzzy. The whole plant is covered with these very short hairs. Now, some people com uh, compare and confuse Dame's Rocket, which is invasive, to the native fall phlox, often called garden phlox, which is phlox paniculata, because the colors are so similar. You know, when you have garden phlox, it too can be pale pink to dark purple. But importantly, phlox has five petals, not four petals, like Dame's Rocket. Dame's Rocket blooms in April to May, whereas phlox doesn't bloom until usually like July. So if you're seeing purple flowers now, four petals, that's Dame's Rocket. So in the same way that garlic mustard can form dense areas, that's what Dame's Rocket does as well and why it's a concern because it'll displace wildflowers. So let's talk about control. And we're going to talk about garlic mustard and Dame's Rocket together because exactly the same control methods can be used for the two of them because of their similar habits. So pulling. People know that these species are often pulled. Many people are familiar with pulling garlic mustard. And this is a great way to get rid of both of them if, if is in capital letters. So there's a lot of ifs here. You have to pull up the roots with the plant. So if you see this picture here, this is the base of the plant. This is the root crown in here. You have to remove this root crown or it will re-sprout. So you have to get everything out of there. Not everything, but the root crown. If you leave some of these smaller roots down here in the soil, that's okay. It's just this area up near the top. You need to go back and pull it multiple times before the plant has set all of its seed. Because you can go through and get 75% of the plants pulled, say, in March or April. But these sometimes will uh, pop up late, or they got stepped on while you were out pulling earlier, and you didn't see it. So you really need to go back at least once preferably twice before the plants have really set seed to continue pulling. Once you get to the point where you've got open flowers and seed stalks, which is really now, you need to remove and dispose of the plants. Um, before that time, if the plant does not yet have open flowers, you can just pile them on logs hang them in trees, just put them some way that they don't make contact with the soil and reroot. But once the flowers are open, you have to worry about the plant continuing to set seed. So one way to do that is simply take big hefty bags and take the entire plant, toss it in there and haul it out. If you have a lot of plants or a long way to hike, you can get away with just breaking off the top half of the plant that has the flowers and haul that out and then pile the other half on logs. Um, another method that people have commonly used is twisting. You gather up your garlic mustard, you take it and you twist it hard a couple different ways. You wrench it so that the vascular tissue between the roots and the uh, upper part of the plant is disrupted. You can do this if there's no seed pods already on the plant, but if there are seed pods there, you have to remove that top half of the plant at least. So those are some ways that you can remove it from the woods or keep it from continuing to produce seed. And now you have to do that same thing for seven to 10 years because the seed bank 
lasts for roughly 10 years with garlic mustard. And the same is basically true of Dame's Rocket. The same process is used, the same pulling, the same removing of the seed pods and flowers to remove those from the site. So that's if you want a non-chemical -chem option. If you're open to uh, using herbicides to control garlic mustard and dame's rocket, um, you can use a two or three percent glyphosate, uh, commonly sold as Roundup, but sold under many other trade names as well. And you can spray it when native plants are dormant in the fall or the early spring. That's why we talked about garlic mustard in the winter one, because that's the time to spray without having to worry about harming other natives because they're dormant underground. That's no longer a great option because if um, you do spray it now, you will certainly control the, the garlic mustard and dame's rocket, but it is very hard to spray those plants without hitting uh, valuable native plants that may be nearby. Um, spraying, if you are in a site that has natives, is better to do during the dormant season. If you're dealing with a site that's shown in this picture and there is literally nothing but garlic mustard, and I did a site um, two weeks ago um, that was garlic mustard and poison hemlock and nothing else. And I sprayed then because there was no other native, there were no native plants to harm. So you have to really evaluate what risk there is and what you're going to harm if you spray at this time of year. But those are basically the two methods. You either pull it or spray in the dormant season if possible. Okay, now we're gonna talk about this series of uh, shrubs and one tree that bloom in the spring. And then we'll talk about controlling all of them at the same time at the end of that because they are all um, controlled in the same way. Mulsifer rose is really a painful, painful invasive plant. It is a fast growing multi-stemmed rose plant. It can be up to 10 feet tall. I've seen it taller than 10 feet. It will scramble up trees uh, and get really tall. Um, it is one of our most widespread invasive uh, shrubs. Um, it will be in bloom in about two to three weeks, probably late May. And you can recognize it because it has many uh, flowers. Multiflora means many flowers. Uh, many small white, usually, flowers in the inflorescence versus our native roses typically just have one or two or three larger rose flowers, and they're usually pink. Those flowers then turn into rose hips, and because you had many flowers, each flower turns into one rose hip, and so you'll have many of these red fruits. Many of you may be aware that if you don't have flowers or fruits, the way to tell multiflora rose from our native roses is to look at the stipule. The stipule is a little fringe of tissue that's at the base of a leaf where it meets the stem. And in the case of multiflora rose, it's very fringy. Our native roses, it's just a solid green flap here at the base. So if you see this fringe or comb-like stipule, that tells you it's multiflora rose. Um, also, a thing to note is that multiflora rose thorns point down, they hook down just a little bit. Um, our native swamp rose uh, is a, a common native in wet areas. Its thorns go straight out, they don't hook down. So, um, oh, here's a good picture of the stipule of our climbing rose. So, what I meant was, you know, a green flap here, just a simple little tissue, rather than the fringe that you see from multiflora rose. So it's pretty easy to tell them apart, the native roses apart from multiflora rose. Autumn olives just started blooming this week, and the thickeningly sweet 
scent is filling the air. If you've been hiking uh, recently, you've got an area that's dominated by autumn olive. You're smelling these flowers that are now open. Uh, they're tubular. They have four little petals at the end, a strong smell. Um, uh, they can look a little yellowish with age. That's just shown in this picture. Um, the, uh, each of those flowers then turns into these little red berries. Um, and that'll be in September, October, that those berries uh, ripen and are eaten by wildlife. And then they poop out the seeds and spread the autumn olive further. A super easy way to tell it, even if you don't have the flowers and the fruits, of course, is the leaf. Um, the top of the leaf tends to be a little bit shiny and a dark green, but the bottom of the leaf is a very characteristic silver color and it flashes in the light um, because of the little reflective hairs that it has all under the underside of the leaf. Um, there are a couple uh, similar looking species that are native, like the russet buffalo berry, but um, it's now extinct in Indiana. It was never a very common species, so it's not something we're really going to see. We do have a few individuals of Russian olive in the state. Often people misstate and call this species Russian olive. Russian olive was planted to the west of us because it's a much more drought resistant species. And it has, see how silvery it is on the underside? Russian olive is silvery on the top side too. So the whole, thing, the whole leaf, which is a little longer and narrower than autumn olive, is silver on both sides. So occasionally you'll see these um, Russian olives that were planted along highways, but they really haven't moved much in Indiana for whatever reason. Out west, Russian olive is horrifying. It's taken over a whole riparian areas in the west. Okay, Asian bush honeysuckle uh, will be blooming in the next few weeks. Um, and there are a number of species. We have Amur honeysuckle, which is Lemisera macchiae. That's the most common one by far in the Monroe County area. There's also Maro's honeysuckle, Tatarian honeysuckle, and a cross, a hybrid between those two called Bell's honeysuckle. They all look really similar. So we tend to talk about them all at the same time. Amur honeysuckle, the most common one here, will have the white flowers and uh, reddish berries in the fall. Morrow's honeysuckle uh, often has the white uh, flowers, um, hairier leaves, leaves that are quite different from, this is Amur honeysuckle leaf, this long pointed leaf. The leaves are opposite. None of them have any teeth, but what distinguishes the Amur honeysuckle is the long pointed tip. When you get to Morrow's and Tatarian, the little egg-shaped leaflet, just little round oval without that long um, tip. One different species that can be and has been confused with honeysuckles is our native coral berry. This is an important one to know um, that coral berry is very common in many of the forests in Monroe County. It is smaller than the invasive honeysuckles. Um, usually only gets three feet tall, whereas the invasive uh, honeysuckles can be up to 15 feet tall. Um, it also, the similarity is it has the opposite leaves with no teeth. Um, and so, and the berries, which come from the flowers shown here, are in clusters along the stem. So that can superficially look like it. But the flowers in coral berry right here are much smaller than um, the Asian bush honeysuckles, which have these much larger, showier flowers. Oh, there are a few other similar species. This is a very rare species. Uh, I think there's one site in the state, so it's not likely that you're going to see this species. Uh, there's also native northern bush honeysuckle. Um, but uh, this is 
differs in several ways from the Asian bush honeysuckle is like having a solid stem. Bush honeysuckle, if you cut its stem, it's hollow. But the uh, northern bush honeysuckle has a solid tip. It has leaves that have teeth on. Uh, and fruits are capsules, which are dry, small fruits, not the uh, berries. Okay, the next shrub, blunt leaf trivet, will also be blooming in the next month. It too uh, has fragrant flowers. Um, well, he says, it says in here they're unpleasantly pungent. I wouldn't describe it as pungent. That may be a matter of opinion. But uh, these terminal clusters of white flowers also have four petals. In some ways, they look a little like the autumn olive flowers we looked at, kind of tubular with four flaring petals at the end. Um, so, so are black berries that hang off the end of each stem. Um, the leaves are quite similar in some ways to the Asian bush honeysuckle in that they're opposite each other on the stem and they don't have any teeth. But these leaves tend to be a little smaller and narrower than in privet than in the Asian bush honeysuckle, which are a little larger and broader. Um, they're, let's see, for similar species, they note the viburnum prunifolium looks a little similar. Um, it does, but, uh, and viburnum prunifolium, black haw, is super common in our forests as well. Um, but they do have teeth on the leaves. And these are the flowers of black haw. I saw one in bloom this week. It was 12 feet tall and covered in these huge white flower clusters. Black haw is a gorgeous native shrub. I just have to put that pitch in there. If you're looking for a landscaping shrub, it's a great one to plant. Um, so it has some similarities, but I think it's easily told uh, as, as different from the blunt leaf privet. And calorie pear. I think this is the last one. We have to talk about calorie pear. I think everyone on this phone call realizes what a disaster this species has become. Um, in the last month, we have seen it in flower. Uh, the petals are dropping now, especially with all this rain we've just had. Um, and this is it in flower, small tree covered in white flowers. Uh, those flowers will turn into these small, about a third of an inch diameter brown fruits. Um, the leaves on it often uh, turn a burgundy color in the fall. These are small calorie pears in a field over by Lowe's in Bloomington. Um, the leaves this time of year look like this. They are usually shiny. It's easy to see these now when you travel down I-69 or other corridors and you see these small trees with sh like shimmery, glossy leaves. That's calorie pear. When you look closer, you'll see that they have sort of a broad base. They narrow down to the tip. Um, and it has very fine teeth around the whole margin of the uh, leaf, as well as the entire leaf surface doesn't lay flat. The whole edge of it undulates. So it has both fine teeth and sort of an undulating margin. Um, we're finding these are now dominating forest understories, rights of ways, fields, um, roadsides are just covered. This is a forest uh, in Martin County, not far away, and all the green you see is calorie pear. It has completely invaded the understory. And this one federal property has 8,000 acres that looks like this. The calorie pear has eliminated most of the natural tree regeneration so that we're not getting back oaks and beaches and basswoods and maples and so on. All we have are calorie pear. So it's, it's a very problematic invasive species. Uh, it was initially introduced a particular cultivar called Bradford pear and it was so popular until people realized that the tree would split. It had very weak crotch, bad branch architecture. So while we had only one cultivar that was being planted, it's not self-fertile, and so it couldn't produce fruit. 
But when they went back to fix the problem of the branch architecture and created new cultivars, well, those were different genotypes than Bradford. So when they had a Bradford and somebody then planted an aristocrat or a Chanticleer or a Cleveland Select next to it, there were two genetic different individuals, they can and did reproduce with each other and start producing all of these little brown fruits. So it's, it's really been a disaster. Uh, and we're seeing that now play out in real time as we see uh, calorie pear take over the open spaces all around town. All right, so I gave you that quick tour of multiflora rose, autumn olive, privet, Asian bashani suckles, and calorie pear. And how do you control them? The same ways are used for each of them. Basically, for woody species, these are your options. I divide how you approach killing them by the size of the shrub more than the species involved. If you're dealing with small individuals, um, you can pull them out or dig them out. Like I mentioned, we do loan out toolkits and we have uh, weed wrenches that can be put clamped around the base of a shrub and pull them out. That works well with especially smaller ones because the clamp only gets so big, about four inches. So um, smaller ones are easier to pull out also easier with some species than others. Asian bush honeysuckle is known for having really shallow roots. And that means it's fairly easy to just grab one that's a foot or two tall and pull it out with your hand. It is harder with some of the other species because they have deeper roots. And of course, it's harder with multiflora rose because of those thorns. If you don't want to pull or dig out the small ones, another way to approach it is to use a foliar spray of 3% glyphosate herbicide with a half percent surfactant. Surfactant is added anytime you spray an herbicide on leaves, it's a soapy solution that helps an herbicide stick onto a leaf instead of rolling off. The foliar spray, this is someone shown doing foliar spray. Um, importantly, because you're using an herbicide and spraying it uh, over a large area, you wanna make sure that you are always covered. You've got the gloves, the long sleeves, the long pants, closed toed shoes, because you don't wanna get any herbicide on you. That's also the reason why I'm saying that this is a good method for small plants plants where you would be spraying down and not using that much herbicide to cover the entire plant. For larger plants, say an Asian bush honeysuckle that's 15 feet tall, you don't want to use a foliar spray because you're going to be spraying up and that spray is going to get way beyond your intended target. You always want to minimize the amount of herbicide that you're using. So foliar spray is another way to control a small privet, honeysuckle, calorie pear, etc. But what if it's a large plant? What if it's you know more than waist high, more than head high? You got two options. The first is cut and paint. And what I mean by that is that you simply use any sharp tool, whether it's a saw, pruner, floppers, whatever tool makes sense for the size, for the diameter of the shrub or tree that you're dealing with, um, you cut it down, you cut it within a few inches of the ground. You can see in this picture, this is a very short uh, amount here. This is probably less than an inch. You can leave it up to six inches if you want, but you don't want it any taller than that, because what you're going to do is you're going to put an herbicide on that stump. And that herbicide now needs to be translocated down into the roots. So the taller that stump is, the further it has to go. Better to keep it just a few inches tall. Now, using 50% glyphosate, that is taking a full strength glyphosate solution. Those are sold with, you look at the ingredient label and it'll say active ingredient, 
glyphosate. And it'll tell you what percent it is. What you want to do is buy the highest percentage you can. Full strength glyphosate ranges from 41% to 55% active ingredient. Then you take it home and you mix it one to one with water, dilute it one to one. That's a 50% glyphosate solution. And that's what you use typically on stump treatment. And you spray it. We, what you can see what they're doing here, they're using a dye, which is always a good idea because then you know where that herbicide is, where it isn't, if you miss the stump. They're doing the outer ring of this large stump because all the only part of this stump that's alive is the cambial layer right here, just inside the outer bark. That's the only part that's able to translocate the herbicide. So you don't need to be putting it on the dead wood that's here because it's not going to do anything with the um, herbicide. So you put it on the ring around the cambial layer. Now, timing, the best time to do this is any time of year except between bud break and full leaf out. And that's what we just had happen for most of these species. Um, they had bud break in early April, and at this point, they're mostly fully leafed out. During that time, what's happening is that the reserves and the roots are being pushed up the cambial layer, the xylem and the phloem, to um, get the energy back up to break the bud and open the leaves. And as you can understand, if, if you've got sap flowing up and you try and put herbicide on that stump, it's just going to roll off. So we avoid doing stump treatments, usually in April, but you can be more specific than that. If, if, the, if the plant you're looking at has broken bud and its leaves are still not wide open, that's not the time to do a stump treatment. Wait till the leaves are wide open. Most of these species around here now, the leaves are just about wide open. So this is a good time to start doing stump treatment. That's probably the simplest and easiest way to do uh, control, the cut and paint method, and most of us use that. Another way though, if you don't want to have to do both uh, the cutting and the painting on the same day, you can just go through and just cut everything in the fall or say in uh, now and wait three weeks. Wait until the re-sprouts come up. They'll be six inches, 12 inches tall. And then you can use the same method we talked about up here with small ones and spray those re-sprouts with 3% glyphosate and one half percent surfactant. And the difference is that you've removed a whole lot of energy from the plant by cutting it down with all its leaves on. And, and so it's already has reduced energy. And then once it's pushing up those re-sprouts, you can uh, hit those with the herbicide and with using very little herbicide on those small re-sprouts, kill the entire plant. So this is sometimes called like plan B, that you get all the cutting done and maybe you didn't uh, have time to do the painting with the herbicide. Maybe you waited too long because when you cut a stem like this, the first thing that happens is the plant gets its defenses together and covers that wound up. And so it makes a callus that will stop the herbicide from getting in. So you generally wanna do this cut and paint, cut and then within a half hour paint, or you're at risk that the herbicide won't be taken in. And if it turns out that you did wait too long or the painting wasn't successful, the plan B method means that just wait three weeks, you'll have re-sprouts, use a little herbicide that's 3% glyphosate, much more dilute than what you use for stump painting, and spray those re-sprouts. So, Ellen, I yeah. Ellen, can I jump in with a question? Um, back, back to that slide, you shared uh, the math for the 50% glyphosate is based on the full strength being what the manufacturer puts into the bottle. How do we calculate the 3%? Is there an easy Yes. Let me show you. That's an excellent question. 
kind of where I'm going next. What I'm going to try and do, I'm hoping, let me see, if I do this, are you still seeing the PowerPoint or are you seeing something else? We're seeing the PowerPoint. Yep, we're seeing. Got it. All right, let me stop sharing. Share screen. Okay, welcome to the MC Irish website. So I wanted to show you a couple of resources here that give you a lot more detail on what we're talking about here. If you go to resources, oh, and by the way, here's that reduce one invasive species challenge for winter creeper. So this is where you would go and click to apply to get the free native plant. You go to resources and you go to information for landowners, all kinds of information. Here's funding information, that's available uh, to support invasive, uh, in a, invasive control in our areas. And under what is the best way to control invasive plants, we have two references I want to bring up. Um, I'm going to start with the calendar of control, but then I'm going to go to the herbicide safety guide, Jillian, and talk about the mixing, because that's what's on there. So let me show you the calendar of control. This is something that we um, have developed over a number of years, having taken it from another group and then changed it to make to meet our needs. This calendar of control, like I just did with you, it puts all the shrubs together here, and then it tells you the best time of the year and the best method to use to control. So that's why I was saying that foliar spray works from May through September, basically while the plant has leaves on it. Um, and the purple is cut surface treatment, which works uh, June through March. The color tells will go to a key at the bottom of the page Orange is 3% glyphosate and 1.5% non-ionic surfactant. Purple is cut surface treatment with 50% glyphosate, 50% water. So all of that information is contained in here. We also have all the evergreen invasive vines, deciduous invasive vines. If we flip to the back side of it, we've got all the wildflowers or forbs from Canada thistle, Japanese knotweed, uh, you just look at the color and the timing and then look at the key to see what the uh, method actually is. Um, and when we look at the bottom of the second page, we also added some information like um, these are commonly sold herbicide brand names with the full strength percent active ingredient in parentheses. So when you see glyphosate and it says 41 to 54 percent, that means that you're looking to buy glyphosate that has an active ingredient of 41 to 54 percent, and that's going to be the full strength that we're talking about when we say a three percent dilution. You're starting with this. So all the different herbicides that could be used are, are in here. Um, the different, the non on surfactant, if you're wondering what the heck is that, where do I find it, here are the name of some really commonly sold ones. When you are working in an area that is on or near water, you may only use water safe herbicides and those are in blue. So if you're on or near water, you're going to look for the blue option on this list. Um, so that's the calendar of control. The other thing that we've created for people to use is the herbicide safety sheet. We give this out with the toolkit. Um, while we have tools that um, are used uh, and then you give back to us, we also give you a Ziploc bag full of uh, different types of herbicide applicators that are empty, funnels, safety glasses, gloves, everything you would need to use herbicides safely. Um, and it gives you the basics of how to do herbicide use safely, what you should be wearing and so on. And on the back is a quick reference guide for mixing herbicides. So if you need a 3% solution of glyphosate and you wanna make one gallon, that means that you add four ounces of the full strength glyphosate to get a 3% solution uh, in one gallon. 
So that all that math is done for you. We give you some uh, definition. And so that's um, two different things that are on our website under information for landowners that you might find useful. So did that answer your question, Jillian? Yeah, I think absolutely. It's a great resource. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Carrie. She's asking, uh, we're seeing Japanese barberry bushes. She's wondering, she thinks that they're going to be like the next Bradford pear. But I wonder also, Carrie, if your question might be, would we treat Japanese barberry the same way that we would treat these four bushes? Well, I'm thinking the more nurseries I've seen, people bought, buying different varieties of barberry. And so, and one of the nurseries was saying, oh, well, now this one's sterile. And I kept thinking, well, that's what we thought about Bradford pear. And is there a way that once these new varieties of barberry coming in close, whatever, with the existing barberry that we all know and are trying to get rid of also, could that potentially lead to the next Bradford pear sort of reproductive explosion? Good question. And same First, with like the euonymus, the viney euonymus varieties, like when the you have the what's it called, the yellow and golds and all those. How do those? I mean, I know you treat them. How you treat them? But what, are we when they start making all these other ones? How far do we go? <laughs> well. Um, Never believe a nursery when they tell you a species oh, is sterile. No, that's what no. I thought. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but here's one difference between Ohio and, and Indiana. We were able to make it illegal to sell Japanese barberry. So, and that includes all cultivars. So there's no more Japanese barberry being sold in Indiana right now. If anyone sees it for sale, tell me. We need to report that. That should be done at this point. Um, but we still do have Japanese barberry in the woods. And I agree, I do see a, an increasing amount um, in larger plants. Uh, it gets contro controlled exactly the same way. It has a shallow root system. It has bright yellow, shallow roots. So if it's a small one, they're fairly easy to pop out. Larger ones, you're going to cut and paint with the 50% uh, glyphosate. So do we work about them, the other ones? Um, do you all in, in Indiana have, you know, the green and gold and different kinds of euonymus? Is the, are those capable of doing the same thing of morphing into new well, plants? All of them are um, already fecund. That is not sterile. I mean, not, uh, all of those that I'm aware of, um, like the green and gold, that's like a hybrid euonymus, I believe. Okay. Um, they're producing fruit, so it's, I don't think it's going to make it worse necessarily. It's already bad because any of the euonymus uh, yes. winter creeper type things are producing fruit if they climb vertically. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, it may cause a little genetic mixture. I'm not sure if there's hybrid potential or not, but since they're already all producing fruit, I don't know that it's going to be necessarily any worse. Okay, that, that's what I need to know because I, I keep advising my neighbors and things and they'll send me pictures of, can I get this? And I'm like, it, no, it says euonymus. You're not allowed to buy it. <laughs> yeah, the, the non-native euonymus, most of them right. cause problems. Yes, that's yeah. what I thought. And I just am thankful for the re, re, reaffirmation. Ellen? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, yes. Another question came in from Kathy Diva. Kathy, I wonder if Ellen answered your question before, but you ask, what do you use for, surfec for surfactant? And I think you may have answered it, but I wonder, Kathy, if you have another uh, side question on that. No, I don't have another side question on that. And, and it was answered on that chart. I saw that uh, when she shared that resource. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, great, Kathy. I'm going to just say this. Everyone says it to me, but I love your accent. Oh. <laughs> it's, my, it's my turn to say that. Uh, 
both of you have great accents. I will say that um, I think that it's really worth going and getting a surfactant. You know, I usually get mine at Rural King or wherever. It's really cheap and it's designed to work with herbicides. You will sometimes see people saying, just add a little bit of Dawn dishwashing soap. The Dawn dishwashing soap has a lot of other additives that you may not be wanting to add in. Um, so it's, it's better to just use whatever surfactant you can find. Um, get a very small bottle because you're only using a tiny amount and a, bo a small bottle will last you for years. Um, well, Ellen, there's another question too from uh, Jill Brianowski. She's asking, is periwinkle vinca on the invasive species list in Indiana? That is a really good question, and I'm going to my handy guide to the regulated terrestrial invasive plant species of Indiana, um, which indeed covers all of those species. And the reason I'm doing is that is because uh, Vinca was ranked differently. So it is not listed. What happened in, in the review uh, and the assessment of invasive plants, they only were made onto the list that was banned if they were highly invasive, if they ranked that high. I believe the Vinca uh, ranked medium. Uh, and so because it was a medium, it did not get added to the list. Um, and so that means that it is not illegal to sell that in Indiana at this time. If I can jump in and just tell my little Vinca story, um, I put periwinkle Vinca in my garden way on the list of the other things that were a top priority in my garden that was planted in the 1960s. But I finally got to periwinkle this, this uh, early spring and I really micro, I had to use microsurgery to get out each and every little plant. But I, in in replace, I put down leaf litter. I just decided I had plenty of leaves left over and I thought I'd put down leaf litter. Within a couple of days, there was a brown thrasher uh, foraging amongst the leaf litter. So if anyone says to you that, you know, it's, uh, it, it, that it's not on the list or it's just contained in one little place, think of it more about the birds that need to forage and even just doing a, a three foot by three foot spot is really worth your effort for the, our native wildlife. And I, I was duly rewarded very quickly to see that brown thrasher. That's fantastic, Jillian. I love that story. Thank you. Well, um, we're kind of coming to sort of the end of the prepared uh, information, but I wanted to talk a little bit about if you're still feeling like, okay, this is all interesting, but I'd really like to try this out myself and see how this works with someone watching over me, we have opportunities for you. We have so many opportunities. Um, we have a number of different work days. Um, I'll, I'll mention one and then I'm going to hand it to Jillian so she can talk about the amazing work she's doing with work days. Um, we started collaborating with um, Bloomington uh, City Parks three years ago uh, on first Saturday weed wrangles. And so the first Saturday of every month, we are at a city park and um, you have to register in advance uh, and we are wearing masks and things uh, physically distant. And you will learn about the park, get to see the really cool plants that are in the park. And then we work together to control particular invasives. And I mean, these days can be magical. We had the most beautiful day at Lower Cascades Park for the um, April first Saturday, and there's a waterfall going, and then and everybody's just enjoying the spring wildflowers, and we're removing the purple winter creeper and uh, cutting out the uh, Asian bush honeysuckle, and it makes for a lovely afternoon. They're one until four p.m. So we've got a link here for where you can sign up uh, for those. Uh, May 1st is going to be Bryan Park, which is always a fun park to come and uh, work in. And Jillian, I'll hand it to you then to talk about uh, some of the other uh, work days that you're managing. 
Yeah, thank you, Ellen. We have lots of opportunities for you to learn hands on about invasive plants and how to make a difference. Uh, you can join us um, each week. Uh, we meet at Lower Cascades on Thursday mornings from 9 to 10.30 in, um, in the Lower Cascades area, meet at the Sycamore Shelter. Uh, at Southeast Park on Fridays from 1 to 2 o'clock. Uh, this is, um, and this Sunday and Monday, we have a pop-up uh, weed wrangle event at Park Ridge East Park. And we are excited to be uh, pulling garlic mustard there, the last stragglers. So that'll be Sunday um, at, from one to two o'clock and then Monday from six to seven in the evening. So we'll take advantage of daylight saving there. And then um, at the end of the month on Mar uh, Saturday, May the 29th, we will be doing a longer work day at the Wapahani Mountain Bike Park. So we're really excited to be working out there. And in each of these cases, we're working with an adopt a park official. So we're partnering with the city of Bloomington and uh, adopt a park or adopt a acre or adopt a trail folks who are doing really amazing work on their own. And we're, they're pulling in people around them in, in their communities. And we're able to have a real huge ripple effect. Uh, so, in the case where of Southeast Park, we are reaching out to uh, that neighborhood, which is Sycamore Knolls. Uh, we're finding out who needs help. We're uh, able to suggest uh, a grant with the Housing and Neighborhood Development uh, Department, who has uh, figured out that a grant really helps move people in the right direction with learning and uh, removing barriers such as the cost of maybe some of the equipment or herbicide. And in addition, it's a really amazing way to get together and work for the com a, a common good that, that really helps our environment. So we've got the science part and then we've got the social part that nudges us along and helps us enjoy working together and we're seeing that ripple effect in uh, even on the other side of town where we have we're, we're close to Griffey Lake where there's a huge infestation of garlic sorry um, Asian bush honeysuckle and Blue Ridge neighborhood has just received a grant of uh, MC Iris is um, our workshops are part of that grant where we will um, offer workshop workshops and technical support uh, all through the process. So if you're in a neighborhood and you're interested, there is uh, grants to be available with uh, City of Bloomington and also with Soil and Water Conservation District. So these are ways to remove barriers and get your friends and neighborhoods and even your church group or your school involved. And we are seeing uh, great success with even at lower cascades, it's a, um, a, a great way to see what happens when you do remove Asian bush honeysuckle, that the understory, the, the spring ephemerals are able to regenerate. And that's the rewarding part. That's why we even exist as a, an organization or a state organization or why you're even all on this uh, Zoom meeting because you care about native plants um, habitat and you want to see that preserved. So um, all together, we're doing a really great job. So, thank you, Ellen. Thank you. And most of these, Jillian is just number, uh, naming off so many different things that we have going on. Um, we try and get them up on our Facebook site. So if you're on Facebook, MC-Iris uh, is, our, is our Facebook group. And so those opportunities will be there. And I try and keep up with them and get them on the, the website as well, but that may not be as quite up to date as the Facebook page is. So that happy leads to plant month. Mm -hmm. Say again. Yeah, um, Ella. happy native plant month, everybody. Oh, last yeah. few moments of of the uh, native plant month across the country and 
actually the woman who helped start it with Hope Taft is, was, is in Cincinnati and um, she's the one who started Ohio's Native Plant Month and got that through with Rob Portman and everything. And so then they kept pushing. So now that it's you know, you know, across the country, but if you are interested in that, I can help you figure out how to get in touch with Nancy Lynn. That's really wonderful. That was so exciting to see that happen and that April is National Native Plant Month. I hope that that's something that every year we can celebrate and really for us in the Midwest, that's just such perfect timing when those spring of funerals are looking so great. Everybody wants to be outside anyway. So uh, yeah, I was celebrating all month. <laughs> great. I'll tell Nancy. <laughs> I have an author. I have uh, a native honeysuckle vine. Is that Lanistera sempervirens? Yeah. Um, if anyone wants cuttings from it to mm -hmm. start their own, you're welcome to come by and take some. That is a wonderful offer. And it's a wonderful landscaping um, vine. I, I've got it myself. It's uh -huh. technically not native to Indiana, but it's native to Kentucky. And I think it might be native to Ohio as well. It just didn't come far enough north to, to be in Indiana. But regardless, it's nearly native. And it's got such a wonderfully long bloom time. I just mm -hmm. think it's beautiful and um, the pollinators love it. Hummingbirds love it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't put out sugar water for hummingbirds anymore. I have about eight different plants that they're really fond of instead. Well, so. if you could, if you're willing to, to share that, if you want to put your email or some way for people to contact you, if they're interested in getting some, that, that would be great. You can put okay. it in the chat. You all have cicadas coming? Do you all have the cicadas coming? Yeah, we have the cicadas coming. Oh, okay. looking, looking forward to it. This is what I'm, I'm wrapping our brand new trees with um, taffeta. And so I've been sewing little tree sacks to prevent, to pr protect the little baby trees we have. So that's what I'm sewing, sorry. You all are wonderful, and I'm always amazed at all of your incredible works and everything that you've done and all the effort that goes into it. And you think of everything, and Ohio people are jealous of Indiana and all that you have done in your native plant conquering mythology. We are very grateful for it. Well, thank you. Ohio has some good things going on, too. As I recall, you were actually able to successfully add cal repair to a list though it that to not be sold though it, there was a five year uh waiver mm -hmm. yeah we haven't been able to do that yet we've been told that it uh would cost small business owners too much money if we were to list cal repair in indiana so we're still working we're st we'll still trying and i did read an article um, because I think in the last five years, people hate cal repair so much as they see it taking over. I saw a quote in a, in a newspaper article last week where the state administrator said, oh, I think we may have to look at listing it because there's just so many people upset about it. So I'm hoping. Well, we'll hope for you. Yeah. But, but I mean, you all, the work that you all have done in general, like our Ohio in, um, invasive group pale in comparison, and we send everybody to your old website. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. So let me see if there were other questions. Yep. Um, oh. yep, Ellen, I see there's one from Patricia. Um, she's asking, will glyphosate alone work as a cut stem treatment on a small amount of Japanese knotweed, or do I have to mix it with another herbicide or surfactant? Glyphosate works well on Japanese knotweed. Here's the tough part. The Japanese knotweed is this bamboo-like plant um, that has stems that might be an inch wide and they're hollow. And so to make the glyphosate work, you have to, if you're going to do cut and paint, you have to cut each of those small stems and then dab the top of it with the 50% glyphosate. That will kill, that will keep the knotweed from, it should, from re-sprouting. Um, so it can be a little tedious. 
because there tend to be a lot of stems to deal with. Um, an easier way might be if you have the ability, just cut down, either mow it, use a weed whacker, and just cut it all down, let it re sprout. And when they're just unfurling their leaves and they're just one foot tall, then spray it with foliar spray glyphosate, 3%. Um, the difference and why you'd want to do that is Japanese knotweed gets six feet tall. And again, you don't want to do foliar spray on big, tall plants, cut them and spray re sprouts. Um, but doing cut and paint on each individual stem will uh, certainly slow down the amount of re sprouting that you'll get. Thanks, Ellen. I, I always love knowing that Japanese knotweed isn't as scary as I always thought it was when I hear you explain those steps. It's it can it's be something... a one, yeah. but I have seen people get good control over it. Yeah, I, I'm seeing it pop up um, in downtown Bloomington, and um, the the utilities department is has sent out a team. I, I kind of put in a that, that I've seen some, so we're we're getting great. Uh, cooperation between our organizations. So uh, if you're not in Monroe County and you're in other counties, really do try and reach out to your, um, the mayor of your city, uh, the housing and neighborhood development, be proactive and help link, be, be, the, be the one that helps link up uh, all the needs and all the resources so that you, you and other people in your area uh, have a voice and that you will have the resources and the barriers removed to to get the invasives uh, under control in your area. And it, it really it does take all of us to to send letters to the editor. Or um, it's great to hear that like that someone in at the in the government is saying yes, calorie pair. We need to we need to look at that. It seems like people aren't happy about that plant. So you, you really do have a voice and can make a difference. I want to uh, speak to Kathy Deaver's point. Um, Kathy, I hope you're still on because Knox County has been really a leader in Indiana in that they developed their own invasive species list and made it illegal to sell a whole bunch of species, including calorie pear. This was before we even got the, the state regulations done. But there's been a re recent change. Um, the city amended the rules, Kathy notes in the chat box, um, for the landscapers. Kathy, as I understood it, they can still sell it, but they have to sell it, is it outside the county? They have to sell it to non-residents of Knox County. It's still, we still can't buy it to plant in Knox County, but they can still sell it to people coming in from out of the county. To, to make it more in with the um, state rules because they're saying they were losing business because people could just go buy it in another county or they could just go across the state line to Illinois because we're right on the border. Right. Yeah. So they're allowing them to still stock it. It does make me wonder like, so they, are, they will sell it to you if you're not a resident. Do they have to? prove that in some way or do you just say oh I'm not a resident I don't know I haven't walked in and tried to buy it so <laughs> I'm sure it's it. pretty lax <laughs> <laughs> all right uh are there I saw one other question much earlier that was about asking if I would do a session on grasses and the next session that we do uh which ought to be that is called the Midsummer Marauders will be on July 7th from 6 to 8 p.m. And that one, we're gonna talk a lot about Japanese stilt grass. That's the main invasive grass that people are struggling with. And so that'll be a big part of, of the next one in this series, the summer uh, episode. Yeah, that'll be something to look forward to. Um, I'm excited to learn more about Japanese stilt grass and any other grasses as well. Um, someone asked, 
Oh, Kathy, you asked um, where is Christine located? Um, it turns out to be Christine and I are really, really close neighbours divided by a train line. So I know that she's in Bloomington. So I hope that helps. Uh, and Susan asked uh, the times and places of all the different things you listed, Jillian. Um, are they posted somewhere? And that uh, you can look at our Facebook site. Uh, if you don't have that, go to our um, uh, website, mc-irish.org. And there's, uh, I think it says calendar and the 2021 events has uh, most of these listed. Great. So yeah, please um, do go to our Facebook and like and share and tag. Uh, these are really great ways to involve your friends and neighbors and family. Um, really, really be, you know more than most people. So just really let other people know what you're doing. Like, what do you think about? You think about this and it, it, you're, it's so, so important. So really take advantage of social media and share and tag and like. And if as you're sharing, uh, you get questions from people that you don't know the answers to, Jillian and I are here to help. So just uh, email us, uh, you can contact us through the website and um, we, can, we can help you have the information you need to be able to talk to your neighbors and friends about this issue. Oh, someone has asked how to buy the booklet. Right, so um, I am gonna put my email in the chat box. And if you want to buy a copy, just email me. We've got it set up for, uh, to make it contactless that uh, you can send me the money and I can tell you how to do that. And then you pick up the guide at the extension office on South Walnut here in Bloomington. And if that's not convenient, we can arrange to mail it to you. So just contact me by email and we can work it out if you'd like to buy one. All right. Any other questions? Well, that may be the end then. Um, thanks everybody for coming. It's always good to have these conversations. I really appreciated all the great questions and uh, all the help that Jillian gave me in doing this. Um, we will record this. And so um, once the link is up, I'll send the link to all of you who signed up for this so that you've got access to it. And with that, I will say goodbye and hope that you have a wonderful day. Hmm.